we're going to make frequency and relative frequency histograms for NUCOMS data. That's the third data set presented in the sample, sample problems uh, lecture notes. I'll show you them here. So if you go to page three of the sample problems notes, you'll see the column for NUCOMS data right here. Okay, so these are the values put in order, and this is their order number. So negative 44 was the third observation, negative 2 was the fifth observation. Um, if you want to read about what NUCOMS data sample represents, you can find that on page 2 of the sample problems lecture notes. On page 3 of the actual lecture notes, there are instructions on how to perform the steps to create a histogram of any data set. Here are the notes I'm mentioning on page 3 of your actual lecture notes. These are the steps that you'll use to create a histogram. Working through the steps then, the first step is to divide the range of the data into classes of equal length. The data range originally goes from negative 44 to 40, if you look at the list of data provided on page 3 of the sample problems. However, I also explain in the sample problems, if you go on to read the whole set of notes, that those two observations are identifiably measurement errors. So that means that they were incorrectly recorded, so we have a justification to drop them. Okay, and I explain in the notes, you should read them, about why we, we, have, uh, we believe we have evidence that we can drop those values. So in fact, there are going to remain n equals 64 observations in the range of 16 to 40. With this range of data, I'm going to propose that we go by a class size <clears throat> of 5. Even though step 2 has uh, an equation to help you calculate the class width, um, Ours is going to be just fine to provide us with six classes, which fits nicely into the guidelines of step one, suggesting that we want between five and 20 classes to fit on a page when making a histogram. So let's begin dividing up the data into classes. Let's make a column for the classes and we're going to start with 15, nice and round number, and, and we're going to go from 15 to 20, which is 5, an interval of 5, where the square bracket in indicates that 15 is included all up until 20, but not including 20, which means all the numbers just before 20, like 19.9999, all the way up to 20, but not including 20. And then 20 to 25, not including 25. 25 to 30, but not including 30, and so on. And here are the others. 30 to 35, not including 35, 35 to 40, not including 40. However, since our last value is 40, we need one more class to include the 40. So this is all to ensure that every single observation has only one class to fall into. So our last class is 40 to 45, not including 45. Next step, we're going to <clears throat> We're going to return to the data and count the number of observations in each class. Okay, so we're going to get the frequency. And then after we've done that, we're going to compute 
the percentage of the total of observations that fall into each class. These columns represent step three, and step four um, explains the difference between them. If you're going to use the columns of the number of observations, then what you've calculated um, are the bars, the height of the bars for a frequency histogram. If you're going to use the percentage observations, then um, the height of the bars is going to be indicated by the percentage of observations, and what you will have is a relative frequency histogram. So let's begin counting. So returning to the data, we see that 44 and ne negative 44 and negative 2 are dropped as measurement error, and so we start at, at observation 16. So let's count how many observations fall between 15 and 20, not including 20. Well, isn't this easy? This is going to be 3. Okay, you're going to fall in the first class. What about between 20 and 25? So you need to go and count how many there are. So here are my counts of the observations within each class. Okay. For a total of 64 observations, if you're to add them up. So the total of 64. To compute the percent of a percentage of observations in each class, we want to figure out what percentage falls out of 64 in the first class, what percentage of 64 falls into the second class, and so on. So here are the percentages for a total of 100%. As explained in step four, the first column will give you the bars for a frequency histogram, and the second column, the percentages, will give you the bars for a relative frequency histogram. Relative, meaning relative to how many observations there are. Okay, so there's three observations out of 64, etc. Now what I want to do next is draw these. In reality, in practical situations, you probably won't be drawing these, but you'll be asking a computer to draw them for you. I uh, need you to understand what goes into making a histogram so you can tell the computer what to do. You're going to have to tell the computer the class size and most computer programs will display a histogram for you. What we need to discuss is what kind of frequency histogram you want. You want a relative or a frequency histogram and what's the difference? That's what we're going to discuss next. Let's draw the frequency histogram for Newcomb's data. I'm going to include the title and labels on each of the axes. So here's my sketch of the histogram with the labels. Time is the variable of interest. Number of observations um, give me the bars of the histogram and it's called a frequency histogram of Newcomb's data. For time or the observation just like our x variable, which we don't have to write on our graph, but I'm just going to remind you to look at the classes. We went by 5, and we started at 15. We have enough room here to begin um, with 0 in the center, and we can number all the way across. As far as the, the, the height of the bars of the histogram, the highest one will have uh, 28 observations in it. So we need to go as high as 28. Let's also go by fives here. Okay. 
Okay, the first bar is going to begin at 15 and go to 20, and it's going to have a height of 3 because there's 3 observations. And so, because this is not exactly to scale, it's just a sketch, I'm also going to include the number of observations in the bar. The next bar is going to be height 13. And because this is not to scale, it's just a sketch, I'm going to put the number 13 in the bar. And we can complete the histogram in this fashion. And there we have the frequency histogram of Newcomb's data. And we see a distribution that's very regular, symmetric around the class 25 to 30. And since we have this graph, now we can interpret the five features of the distribution. The shape is symmetric, the center would be the mean, the the spread, a uh, good measure of spread, would be the standard deviation. There are no gaps or outliers. And there's just one single peak. All right, next would be to make the relative frequency histogram. And here it is, <clears throat> the relative frequency histogram of Newcomb's data. I've put the percentage of observations on the vertical axis, and that's what the bars represent, and I've included the percentages total um, in each bar. And we can say that overall, in all of the bars, the bars sum to a total of 100%. Okay, so this is the relative frequency histogram. How does it differ from the frequency histogram? And how do we compare graphs? We consider the five features of the distribution, okay? So going through the five features, let me make it visible that you see both graphs here. All right, the five features, shape, well, they're both symmetric. Center, both within 25 to 30, you'll have the, the mean as a measure of center. For spread, you should use the um, standard deviation because it's symmetric data and uh, there are no gaps and outliers and there's only one peak. These points, these five features are true for both so really using one or the other doesn't need to be based on the features of the distribution so why would we pick one or the other or is one more popular than the other? In fact the, fr the relative frequency histogram is more common uh, you'll see that used more often because the fact is when I refer to uh, the distribution I know that 44 percent of the observations for instance fall in the modal class of 25 to 30 this is where the most observations are um, that's more information than having to tell someone 28 observations in the frequency histogram fall in the modal class because anybody trying to interpret that would say well what's 28 represent out of the total so they're asking you to make the calculation 28 out of 64 rather than do that let's just look at the relative frequency histogram where we know that's going to be 44 percent so we like the relative frequency histogram because it shows us how important how significant each of the bars are relative to all the observations. Keep in mind to look at the graphs, they look in terms of the five features identical otherwise. The final point I'm going to make um, regarding the histogram is when would you use the histogram instead of the stem and leaf plot? Well, notice what's the difference between the two. The difference between the two, one of them anyway, is that we can use it for continuous data. Um, a second difference is that in the histogram you don't see the observations. You see in the stem and leaf plot you will see in each of the classes the actual values that exist 
So if you need to see the observations, you should show a stem and leaf plot. If you don't need to see them and you can lump them together in, in classes and just look at bars, um, and that's going to be the case for lots and lots of data, like for 60 to 100, 100 or more observations, you're going to want to use a, a histogram, not a stem and leaf plot.